Hall. And I introduce Andy Sylvester to you all. Andy, thank you very much for joining us. Pleasure. Um, Andy, before we begin, has anyone ever said Anthony Wordsworth to you? No, I get Peter Crouch quite a lot. Because if I stand up, I'm about six foot one and lanky as well. So um, oh, uh, I got okay. shouted, shouted at uh, outside a pub uh, last year because I refused to give somebody an autograph. <laughs> Peter Crouch. Um, and they wouldn't, they wouldn't take no for an answer. But I'll take Wordsworth. It's quite annoying when people come up to you for autographs. I get confused for uh, Tom Cruise quite a lot. Um, and Ryan Gosling, no doubt. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you must. Yeah, obviously, obviously you see it, clearly. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much for taking the time to stand for election this year. Pleasure. Yeah, no, it just felt like the right time to do it. It is much appreciated. And um, before we get into your manifesto and questions around that, just ask you some to begin with, uh, if you can give those of us or those people watching a brief rundown of what you're up to at the minute, what's your occupation, where are you based at the moment? Uh, so, yeah, as of a couple of weeks ago, I took over as editor of City AM, which is, a for those of you who don't see it, um, kind of business-focused newspaper um, based out of the city of London, but around uh, the capital. We're currently not in print um, because you may have noticed 2020 got a little weird. Um, so yeah, I'm editing it now online only, and then we hope to be back in print in, in April. Um, before this, worked in a few various roles. Um, uh, like all journalists, I did my time at the uh, the Murdoch, the, the feet of Murdoch, um, working for the newspaper that I know is sometimes controversial, the, uh, the Sun. <laughs> and before that worked, um, uh, various sort of campaigning groups in and around Westminster uh, in politics and communications. And in terms of my kind of Wimbledon um, credentials, I'm actually a Sellers Park kid. Uh, my first game was, I think, 95, um, miserable January day against Everton, which won 2-1. Um, and then that sort of came about through football in the community. My parent, my dad was a Wimbledon fan, but kind of fell away post play lane. Um, and then, yeah, I went to Sellers as part of the football in the community stuff um, and then fell in love with Wimbledon and obviously followed it ever since um, to many uh, from, from non-league to, um, to the Stadium Alliance. I'm sure we'll come back to the football and community scheme yeah. as the interview progresses. Uh, just very quickly, your favourite Wimbledon player of all time? Of all time. So <laughs> I made a bit of a cock up of this once when I was about eight years old on Telewest Channel 17. You might remember <laughs> Friday Football with Johnny Gould. I was on as Wimbledon's number one fan as an eight year old. And uh, it was me and Robbie Earl. And uh, I was asked by Johnny Gould who my favourite player was at the time. And we just signed Ben Thatcher. So for reasons that I cannot ascertain to this day with Robbie Earl sat there, Wimbledon club legend, I said my favourite player was Ben Thatcher. So I've learned my lesson now. Um, the answer is, is, of course, Robbie. Of course, Robbio MBE to give him his indeed title. Yes, <laughs> stand out. I lost you slightly there, but I think you're asking about the current uh, playing setup. I have to say, I've been really impressed with when we're able to play him and actually get him moving forward. I'm really impressed with Chislet, and I like that we're doing a bit of that Wimbledon thing now of bringing on lads from non-league. So Piggott being obvious, one of this example, but. Um, bringing in people like Nesta, bringing in people like Ethan Chislett and actually seeing them develop into league football players has been really satisfying over the past couple of years. Great, thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to ask those um, following and watching along, um, just as you mentioned my connection there, if I am, or if you're struggling to see me, if my connection is a bit dodgy, can you let us know in the chat and I'll refresh it because I am going through Virgin Asia and they absolutely suck right now. Well, it looks like we've lost Nick, so I guess it's just me hosting my own hustings, which is a slightly odd experience. <laughs> there we go, Steve. Join, there we I'll go. Join in. I'll Stepping join in. in. <clears throat> so, sorry, who is your current, current favourite? Well, I wouldn't say he's my favourite player. I've just been really enjoying sort of the, the ethos of the current club right now, um, probably in a way that we slightly lost our way um, in those sort of weird, oddly ball seasons. Um, of bringing in the both academy players through having people like Ossiu and Hartigan, people like that, but just bringing in non-league players as well and seeing if they can step up. It feels very old school Wimbledon rather than that sort of period where we were just picking up cast offs like Trotter and Saws and seeing what they could do. Brilliant. Okay, so sort of going. Oh, are you back? I'm staying. Okay, I filled in. I, I, I feel quite, thank I, you very much. It's like a live link fill in that was. So we'll give you yeah, um, Andy. We'll give you an extra time for that. Obviously. Oh, God, so, all right. 
Yes, uh, thank you, Stu. Apologies to those watching. Yes, my Wi-Fi is having major issues once again, but we won't go into that now. Right, so Andy, sorry about that. No um, before I was rudely kicked off <laughs> the stream, I was going to ask you, editor of City AM, yeah. very, we will get into the business side of business credentials in a moment. Just to say one of your rivals in the uh, free commuter newspaper industry would be the Metro, of course. Yeah. Which... Um, should you be elected, it might be interesting with a with a fellow member of the, the board currently, but we won't get into that now. <laughs> um, your, your manifesto does actually begin by you saying that AFC Women should become a successful, well-run business yeah. in the heart of the community. And does that mean you you foresee your your role on the Donsworth board should you be elected as one that sees the club primarily through a business lens? I wouldn't say that necessarily, but I think if you go back to kind of first principles of what a board needs to be for a company that has you know a six million turnover and you know a huge football stadium in the middle of you know very expensive real estate part of town um you need to have that level of scrutiny on the board and kind of just constantly pushing um forward with new ideas and i think one of the the reasons that i guess i felt like this was maybe the right year to at least stick my hand up for it and to be part of the debate even if it doesn't necessarily turn into a board position was that you know for so long the club's strategy focus completely understandably because of some incredible work by some incredible individuals um has it has in a sense been achieved we're back at plow lane um we're a club in wimbledon and i guess the question is now how do we make sure that everybody at the club on the kind of the actual club side rather than the board side um is driving forward and driving new opportunities forward with that stadium and using that new asset that we've got in terms of an actual stadium as well as our history our story all the things that makes Wimbledon Wimbledon and ensuring that we become yeah a successful business in Wimbledon um that hopefully down the line means we don't have to look at playing budgets with trepidation because I see no reason why as a club with a 9,000 seat stadium that could grow into 20,000 if we do it properly if we have medium to long-term strategies um, there's no reason we can't be in the championship or indeed more than that if you look at what Bournemouth has done there's absolutely no reason we can't do that. Do you see your expertise in that area then being more of an oversight of what the club are doing or do you see yourself getting more involved with the day-to-day -day running alongside the football club board? Well I would certainly see it more as 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 oversight um i say through my time at city am i spent an awful lot of time looking at annual reports and trading updates and long-term plans of, of various companies and you can always start to see when trouble is on its way and i don't think one would there by any stretch of the imagination but what you notice is that there starts to become a sort of lack of new ideas or you achieve something massive um, you know, call it a merger or in our case, moving back to Plough Lane. And sometimes ideas can stop and you can sort of rest on your laurels for want of a better phrase. Um, and actually what the board needs to do at those points is to congratulate everybody for what they've done. Um, many of you will be on that board and then ask the question about what do we do with that asset now? Where do we go forward? And actually some of the things that the thing that kind of made me think that we still we do need to push on a little bit more as a club. Um, at this kind of inflection point between going back to Plough Lane and now building on Plough Lane, which is a massive opportunity for us, um, was watching a woman game I follow outside the Alex. Um, guy with the Chelsea shirt on was, sort of came over and looked very surprised by the concept that we could even be on iFollow, um, the three of us there. Then asked who we were watching, which considering I think I had an old sort of 80s Wimbledon tracksuit on, mate of mine had a Wimbledon scarf on. I thought it was fairly obvious with the scarves and everything. Um, and he's, he was completely unaware of of our return to Plough Lane. And, you know, the guy lived in Wimbledon. And, you know, I'm not suggesting that's anything about um, the intellectual quality of your average Chelsea fan, but put it this way, we need to be a part of that community. We need to have him think, I'm actually solid. I don't want to go and spend 70 quid at the bridge, but I have got a five-year-old and a seven-year-old. How do we get those guys into the stadium that become the next generation to build Wimbledon into not just, you know, this great club that's back to Plough Lane, but how do we go and grab those new fans in this great community that we've got huge amounts of disposable income? How do we bring them into the club? And from a board perspective, how do we make sure that the club is set up in such a way that it can do that effectively? Right now, um, you know, you look at that Imperial College Business School report, which is no tablet from heaven. It's not perfect, but, you know, Joe Palmer having, I think, 12 direct reports doesn't strike me as being the most sensible way to do it. So the board needs to drive that change as well. Yeah, you referenced that in your manifesto alongside the idea of uh, key performance indicators, which I think was as well referenced in that report. Yeah. Um, what role would you play on the board 
in that? Would it wouldn't come down to you necessarily to to set targets? Would you be just monitoring to make sure that the processes are in place? And for yeah, example, think- how would it how would it differ between someone like Joe Palmer's key performance indicators and Glenn Hodges's? Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, that's that. That's why you can't take every co- corporate governance structure that you know the London Stock Exchange will put out and say this is how a company should be run because it doesn't really work in a football club um, to just take that sort of carbon copy and put it onto something where you've got a football club as a commercial entity and then you've got a football club as a thing that plays on the pitch. Um, I think I would like to see my role as very much just constantly having that dialogue with the board, with the the football club. Uh, employees to make sure that they are driving forward their targets there's been some things that I just personally haven't been happy with as we drive forward I don't know if you see the I follow ads that usually pop up at half time but our hospitality advert just I don't know if you've seen it the one where Mm -hmm. we've got people walking in and then there's a sort of no audio wow and I just think you know if I was coming into it for the first time would that one make me buy hospitality and the answer frankly put is is no um so Mara will be a board shouldn't be directing the day-to-day operations, obviously, but what it should do is have an eye on those things and be able to hold people accountable for them and drive them on to, you know, against clear indicators. So everybody knows kind of where you're going um, and what's expected of people to make sure that when we get back in Plough Lane and we can all go there, that we're joined by new fans and that when we can build up to a 20,000 seat stadium, I'm doing this not out of any criticism of anybody that's come before or anyone at the club. I just think that it's important that, at this precise moment in our history, as we move to a whole new phase of what it means to be Wimbledon FC, AFC Wimbledon, that we are constantly on the ball and making sure that we never become complacent, we never start talking just to ourselves, we never get stuck in a in a rut of thinking, well, we're back now, it's all it's all good. Because we've got to drive forward, not least because financially, you know, there are going to be pinch points in the years to come because of the way the stadium has been funded. So we need to make sure we've got that risk analysis set up beforehand and that we've got those performance indicators that guide us there so that we don't get surprised again. You mentioned the stadium and with everything that happened with the stadium in terms of deficits financially that we needed to make up and the whole project getting over the line, lots and lots of time that was taken, Joe Palmer's time concentrating on that. Do you think that was and has been a stumbling block in terms of putting in proper processes and keep KPIs for staff? Has that just been pushed to the side? Well, I mean, it's always difficult from the outside and you can only read so many board minutes and so on and so forth to get a, a seal on it. In a sense, the stadium project to me struck me as the best in the, the last year to 18 months or so. Struck me as both the best and worst of, of, of Wimbledon in the sense that when it was needed, you had some incredible individuals, many of whom are standing for board and who I would probably expect to get elected more than me, um, you know, stepped up to the plate and came up with innovative ways to to fund the stadium, to fill those funding holes. At the same time, it still struck me from the outside. And obviously people on the board will know more about this than I do. And certainly when you look at the minutes, you can only judge so much. Um, it felt that suddenly 11 million quid was just missing and nobody quite noticed, nobody really flagged it before. It became as a bit of a bolt out of the blue to any kind of external watcher. So I think in all, in, what we need to do is make sure that we harness the great power of AFC Wimbledon, which is the fans, the volunteers, our history, our story, but just have those professional structures in place with KPIs, with clear ideas of, of our revenue targets, et cetera, et cetera, going forward. Um, so that all of this, the extra stuff, the stuff that makes Wimbledon Wimbledon, the stuff that makes the club great, the stuff that makes it an international story, as Freddie was saying, you know, we can then just, that's a, those, those are things to build on rather than having to sort of just go back to first principles and go back to crowd funders and go back to, to bond issues, you know, stuff like that. So we just need to make sure we're always moving forward and trying to anticipate things rather than reacting. Another area that you state in your manifesto you want to look at, um, and I suppose allied to your role as a journalist, as an editor, you want to improve communications locally and nationally. Where do you think we're lacking in this area? How do you change that from your position? On the well, board? I think I think actually some of the things that Freddie said there, which is a, the great thing about this whole process, is that nobody has a monopoly on, on good ideas. And Freddie's exactly right that we've got this great international story as well as a national story. And linked to that previous question about Wimbledon being a movement, so to speak. Um, you know, we are, for many, many football fans across the country, 
everybody's second team. There's a reason we were on, you know, when we were first coming into the league, we were always on telly. Whenever we had an FA Cup game, we were always on telly. We played Halifax away, for goodness sake, and ended up on telly. Um, and that miserable game at Harringay Borough away, when I think all of us that were there wished we'd stayed at home and watched it on telly. Um, there is something to AFC Wimbledon that very few other clubs in the country have. And I think we shouldn't be shy about leveraging that um, for commercial gain frankly, as much as anything else. So talking to bigger sponsors about being a part of a modern movement in football, not, you know, against modern football, but being part of a new model of fan ownership in football with successful clubs that are run properly, run well, a bit like the Green Bay Packers in that sense. Um, and just making sure that we're constantly in dialogue with newspapers, national newspapers, to make sure we've got those relationships. Because there was a wonderful burst publicity on Tuesday. Uh, a couple of Tuesdays ago, right? The like Monday, Tuesday. It was brilliant. Um, it felt like being, it felt, it, it felt like you could just go on bbc.co.uk slash sport and you'd expect to see a Wimbledon story. It must, it must be like being a Man United fan, right? <laughs> but it, I worry that we only have those kind of inflection points when foul lane happens or when we play franchise. And actually what we need to be doing is telling a more coherent story across the piece. You know, the Don's Local Action Group is absolutely inspiring. And it's been on BBC London News a little bit, but this is something that needs to be told to the world. And then we need to bring those people in who are inspired by that story. And this is one of the key things I'd like the, the club to do and the, the trust to do as well, is get those people who are inspired by Wimbledon's community spirit, by the fan ownership model, to make that leap into becoming consumers, either buying tickets or indeed joining the trust, if that's so to speak, if they don't want to vote, whatever, but just to be part of this movement. So I think... Our key thing in communications is not just telling the story, but it's about how to get people involved as well. I guess that plays a key role. When you say in your manifesto, the club needs to be secure for generations to come. Um, I was going to ask you about what steps would be involved in that, but I'm assuming um, you've sort of answered that already in terms of local and national message, but also sponsorship and getting those sorts of people involved to help keep us financially secure and stable. Yeah, I mean, sponsorship, revenues, I don't think we need to go any further at all in terms of giving away equity. Um, that's, for, that's for sure. But I don't think that that should stop us progressing as a football club on the pitch um, if we have the structures in place off the pitch. You know, I want to, I don't have kids, but you know, I will at some point have them. I hope, and I want to take them to Plough Lane and I want them to know that they'll be able to take the next generation to Plough Lane. And I don't want to have to say, you might have to dip into your pocket again for a crowd funder in 10 years' time if, if we've, we've sort of missed a trick. So we just need to make sure that like, like every other football club, that we become normal off the pitch, that it becomes normal and just a working assumption that we will have that ground in 20 years' time, that we will be in the Football League um, and just putting those structures in place to make sure we've got a bit of certainty that we can then build on. Um, and I think we're all a bit tired of a kind of transient year to year. There's always a setback. I mean, a global pandemic has turned up to stop us going back to Flower Lane, only Wimbledon. But like making, just going back to being a normal football club able to build on the pitch with a secure off the field base is just something that I think is really important to the club. I've got a number of questions that have come in from viewers so um, I'm conscious of time but very very quick you've already mentioned there you don't foresee giving away more equity as a solution going forward. We recently accepted a minority investment 10% of the club. Uh, was that in a word a right decision at the time? I think once you start the stadium you have to finish it within a decent time frame. So for that, in extreme circumstances, yes. But as I say, I will not go any further. And very quickly, because we have to ask everyone this question, when you make a cup of tea, do you put the bag in first or do you put the milk in first? Uh, I drink coffee mainly. I know, psycho, <laughs> psychopath. But uh, I bag in first, obviously, three minutes and black tea only. Oh, okay, no milk at all. Fair enough. Um, George, we have questions. Yes, we do. Um, the, the first question um, they want to, um, the club recently gave an exclusive to the Sun regarding the new stadium, and they just want to know what your policy would be on that. Um, I think, for better or for worse, you know, I'm happy to talk about my time at the Sun because I was there basically as as kind of part of the internal team who was trying to um, change the paper, I suppose, to a slightly more 21st century outlook. And I'm, there's stuff that you know I'm not proud of that happened there under my watch, and there's stuff that I'm proud of, and I'm happy to talk with, with anyone about that. Um, uh, separately from this um but no i don't i don't personally see it as a bad thing to talk to what is still you know a paper read by by millions of people um both online and in print um i think you just have to as with any media organization you have to set your boundaries and lines and i think the story that was told there that day 
um, was a very positive story about the football club. And I don't think uh, we should get into any territory, as I saw some people talking about, about boycotts and things. I think what makes AFC Wimbledon special in the fan ownership and the fact we are, um, yeah, this new movement of football fans, I think is an inspiring story that people want to get swept up in. I don't think we should stop anybody doing that. Um, some, you just mentioned fan ownership. Um, Chris wants to know, how do you approach ensuring fan ownership is enshrined and is a fundamental part of what AFC Wimbledon is and will always be? Well, I mean, obviously the constitution is the one obvious uh, example of, of how you enshrine it. Um, and I think part of, uh, we, we only got into the position of having to give up any kind of uh, uh, equity stake because we had got to a point where basically projects were running faster than our ability to finance them. So partly I see the board's role as ensuring that we don't get into that position again, um, that we don't ever get into that kind of slightly desperate stake of trying to find this money from somewhere. Because if we run it properly off the field, keeping finances well on board, making sure on five to 10 year plans about where we're going, we shouldn't need to do that. Um, someone wants to, um, talking about that and where we were back in November last year. Um, with restrict, restricted action votes, um, at the moment, the, the threshold is 75% of DT members have to vote in favour. And they want to know your opinions on that. Do you think that should be a higher threshold, lower, or do you think 75% is about right? I think it's about right. Um, you know, I know there are people who would go lower when you look at the German model of fan ownership and, you know, say that that looks, that looks like it works for, for German clubs. Um, I don't like the 51% model. I think if we go any lower than this right now in any lower on the threshold of restricted votes um you're in danger of diluting what it means to be you know a don's trust member and also diluting what it means to be afc one within our fan ownership structure um lee willett wants to know with your journalism and media background uh, what your opinion on the club comms and how what would the, what would you change about them in the short term and long term uh i think the club's communications with fans could be significantly better um i think we are limited in budget, of course, in terms of what we want to do. Um, but I, I look at stuff like the lack of communication about Stuart Douglas leaving, for instance, being one obvious kind of very just just one of those pinch points where you think, hang on, this could be done better. The guy's been at the club for donkey's years. Come on. Um, and in the in the medium to long term, I think there's an element that you need to actually bring people together almost within the trust structure, but outside of the trust structure, have working groups on match day experience, get people starting to feel like they're a part of the club's uh thinking um as well as kind of having the trust as a sort of oversight governance scrutiny body um somebody wants to know um off the back of DLAG helping people all across south london um do you think it's worth the don's trust setting up a fund to maybe create to help some fans who have fallen on hard times to be able to attend matches yeah i think that's a brilliant idea um you know as a journalist there's an organization called the journalist charity um and most an awful lot of journalists throw 15 20 quid into that a year um so that journalists who fall on hard times um can be looked after they only care home down in um down sussex or sorry um i don't think there's anything wrong with that and i think you know in a world in which women fans have shown the absolute best of themselves and the community work that the dlag have done over the past six months has been one of the most inspiring things in this relatively shitty year. Um, and I think we should absolutely build on that and grow that out. A um, couple more questions. What do you think the Don's Trust does well at the moment? Well, I think Don's Trust well, does well. I think it uh, does a fantastic job of kind of being around the club and the accessibility of people to talk to them. I think they do a very, very good job of that. Um, I think within, to be honest, I think the Don's Trust board currently does an excellent job um, within the structure that it's set up for. The question is, when we look at the structures, um, is it the perfect way to run a £6 million turnover business in South West London? Um, I think that is something that's going to have to evolve. Not, we're not talking about immediate overnight revolution, um, but that's going to have to evolve as we accept the fact that we aren't, you know, this scrappy underdog club coming up through non-league. We are now a, you know, small business in South West London with decent amount of turnover and with a massive asset in the middle of uh, a, a really exciting part of the country a uh, couple more questions what do you think the role of the don's trust board is in relation to its members and the football club what do i think it is or what do i think it should be um i think it, what it should be is something that scrutinizes um you know down to the down to the bottom line um everything that the football club does and how it operates and ensuring that the people that are employed at the football club are pushing forward with new ideas and innovative proposals to make sure that 
you know, 2021 is better than 2020, that 2022 is better than 2021. Um, and I think in terms of how it relates to Don's Trust members, uh, it should be open, accessible. Um, it should be, Don's Trust should be in listing mode constantly to fans about everything from match day experience to the experience of, you know, kids playing within the academy and the parents, indeed the parents of kids who don't make it in the academy to make sure that we are doing our bit and not being another football club that chucks kids out and releases them at 16. You know, we have to make sure going right through the football club, um, both on the men's and ladies side that we, as a, the, the Don's Trust board listens and passes that on to the football club, but then also, you know, pushes the football club employees hard to follow through with with all those recommendations and one final question um they want someone wants to know if you're not successful in standing in, ele- in this election are you still happy to volunteer and offer your expertise and all of that to the don's trust in a sort of volunteering role yeah absolutely i mean when i saw the list of names that were that were standing for nomination i almost mentally struck myself off the list of um of getting anywhere close to because we've got some real club legends running for it but yeah let, I, I credit myself modestly with you know, hopefully knowing a thing about communications and media and about um, the scrutiny of, of businesses, large and small. Um, so, yeah, of course, happy. I think the ethos of Wimbledon is that you do what you can, right? Um, and you, you give where you can. Thank you. That's all we've got time for. Pleasure. Cheers, Andy. Thanks very much for taking time. We wish you all the best in the forthcoming election. Cheers, yeah. And to everybody.